Hello and welcome to the Writing of God. Boy, do we have some exciting stories for you today. The first one is about Christopher Columbus. Not the story you do know, but all the story that you don't know how he was saved by a lunar eclipse. And the second is about Nineveh, the total eclipse of 763 BC when Yehovah sent Jonah to the once great city to implore them to repent or be destroyed. Let's get to it right now. Join ancient language linguist, author, educator, and biblical archaeologist, Dr. Miles Jones, as he explores the writing of God. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the writing of God. Today, we get to tell you the exciting story of Christopher Columbus. Now, this is a story you think you know, but you don't. 1492 is one of the most, probably the most exciting year in all of human history. And Christopher Columbus was the seed of all of that. One thing you might not know, or you may, is that Christopher Columbus was a Messianic. He was a Jew who had converted to Christianity, which was one reason he was one of the most secretive personalities of history. He had his family records burned so no, no one could find out. We were during the full furor of the Spanish Inquisition in 1492, and they were, they were burning tens of thousands of believers every year. So he did not want that to be found out, but he knew Hebrew. That's a dead giveaway. His sons recited a Kiddush prayer over him on his deathbed. Uh, he wrote the Jewish date, the Hebrew date on all of his letters and the Bezerat Hashem, in, by the will of God, I write this. So it's a foregone conclusion at this point. There's lots of research coming out on it. But the doors he opened were magnificent. We know that in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. But what we're going to tell you now are the other parts of the story. Within a, a few years, within eight years of him opening the doorway to the new world, the route to China and India was found from all the interests he had stirred up. So he opened the world to worldwide trade. Europe was awash with money from the gold and silver and gems and new products, new animals, new food stocks, new food crops, and from the silk and the porcelain and the spices coming from all the rest of the world. They used that money to sponsor artists and scientists and painters and philosophers and creating a renaissance in Europe, followed by the Reformation in Europe. So the world was never the same. And we will show you that Pandora's box moment in this show. The reason we're talking about him is he also holds the, one of the keys to the study of celestial events in the heavens because Christopher Columbus almost lost his life on the voyages to the New World. He was a supreme navigator and seaman, but he came up against the natives, and it was a lunar eclipse that saved his life. And this is what he used to convince the natives that he had power so that they would not kill him at that crucial moment. Our history would have been completely different without him. It started in 1492 when King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain had just reconquered Spain from the Muslims who had held it for about 700 years. And now their last stronghold in Granada has fallen. They immediately turned and expelled all of the Jews from their territory. And there were like a half a million uh, Jews and converted and converted Jews, conversos they were called, messianics, who had changed to, who had converted to a belief in, in the Messiah. 
So they were, the, the Inquisition that started, they were trying to winnow out all those who did not fit into the, the doctrinal mold of the prevailing Roman church. So we have Christopher Columbus appearing before Ferdinand and Isabella, and they were very keen on this idea of, of finding the New World by going west, but they had spent all their funds in finishing the Reconquista against the Muslims. So it was actually the Messianic community that funded his voyage to the New World. And let's be specific, that was Luis Santangel, who was the treasurer of Spain, of, of Ferdinand and Isabella, and Gabriel Sanchez, another Messianic. These men believed in what he was doing, and they sent their sons even on his vessel to find a place where they would be safe from the Inquisition and where Messianics could go, Messianics and Jews could go to reestablish themselves far away from this danger. So the expulsion date was August of 1492. And on that very same day, Columbus left port in Spain with a ship full of Jews as fleeing the, the expulsion and of Messianics fleeing the Inquisition. So onward he went across the sea. None of his none of his people, one of the one of the things that, that Christopher Columbus did, neither Columbus nor any of his men had ever been more than three hundred miles from shore. But he figured out the key that allowed uh, travel to the New World for anyone. Uh, he went down south to the Canary Islands where the trade winds were blowing to the east. He caught those trade winds and within a month he was 2,000 miles from Europe. And then when he came back he went up to the north and caught the westerlies which blew to the west to take him back to Europe. It was really genius. No one had ever done this before. But now we had a way to make the circuit from the old world to the new world and back to the old world without getting lost at sea. So there he stepped upon the new world and according to his book, the Book of Prophecies, he uttered the name of the supreme being Yehovah in Hebrew as he stepped onto the shores of North America. He went back to Europe and brought with him a chest of gold that he opened before the pontiffs. He had Indians, parrots on their shoulder, bright colors and spears. It was quite a spectacle, bedecked with, with all kinds of feathered animals with parrots on their shoulders. But it was when he opened that chest of gold that the, that the sovereigns, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabel, fell to their knees to thank God. And there's no doubt that the riches of the New World speeded development there enormously. Immediately, immediately there were more ships going to there and the establishment of colonies. So when he came back, on, he had succeeding voyages, he came back, he ended up stranded in Jamaica. By this time, his ships were worm-eaten and no longer capable of making the trip back to the New World, uh, back, to the, back to the Old World, to Spain, that is. So he found himself on the shores of Jamaica, convinced that the royals no longer wanted him and were plotting his death. And he wrote a uh, letter to Ferdinand and Isabella of such prophetic power that it's almost impossible to imagine. But first, he had to deal with a mutiny among his people and the natives that were also rebelling against him would no longer feed him. So his mutineers were raping and rampaging across, across the island of Jamaica. So he armed the messianic sons, the teenage sons of his financial supporters and the mutineers just laughed at them. But the first six that tried to rush them were immediately shot down and they soon had the leaders of the revolt in chains. But he still had to, he still had to deal with the native revolt. 
he had a copy of Zacuto's Almanac. So he established a palaver with them, with their chief, Huero, in the evening of February 20th, 1504. This was the evening of a full lunar eclipse. And he said to them, Behold the moon, it will rise in a flaming wrath to show you that God disapproves of your treatment of me. And that night, right after sunset, the moon rose, the lunar eclipse happened, and we witnessed a blood moon so fiery and so angry that the natives came running to him, begging him for his support and promising to continue to provide them with all of their needs. Without this, he probably never would have made it back to the, to the old world in Spain. As he stood there on the shores of Jamaica, having been saved by this lunar eclipse and his teenage fighting force of messianics, he wrote a letter to Isabella that was amazing in its prophetic power. He said... Should I die here and my proprietary rights be taken away from me, the ingratitude will bring down the wrath of heaven and all the treasures of the new world will be used, will stir up mankind to bring down revenge and ruin upon the Spanish Empire. Pretty impotent words, one might think, except 1,050 years later, England took the island of Jamaica, which was 50% Messianic, and they sent out an invitation to all the pirates of the Caribbean to make it their home. And with this surrogate Messianic fleet, within 15 years, they took so much gold and silver and wealth from the Spanish Empire that they broke the back of the Spanish Empire. And that is the story of Columbus that you did not know. Stay with us. We'll be back in one moment with more. Yehovah puts lights in the firmament of the heavens to record warnings and Moedim appointed times for his people and him. And it speaks to us throughout the day and the night. They're constantly transmitting information to us. What does that mean? Well, we will tell you about it in our latest series of video lessons about the Moedim and the book Moedim. Go together in a bundle along with the Hebrew Gospel of Revelation, the Hebrew book of Revelation, which certainly talks about celestial events for the end times. All of these things in one bundle from Jonah's eclipse when he was sent to Nineveh to implore those people to repent, and they did, saving themselves from destruction, to the celestial events at Yeshua's crucifixion, to Christopher Columbus who was saved from the natives, angry natives, by a lunar eclipse, a blood moon. So we'll talk about the blood moons, we'll talk about the eclipses, we'll talk about how these things are used to establish the correct biblical timeline of ancient history. So go to writingofgod.com right now to get your copy. Online at thewritingofgod.com That's online at thewritingofgod.com Today, we're going to talk about a celestial event in the heavens that has been one of the most important total eclipses in all of history. It happened in Nineveh, in, all, in Assyria, in June 15th, 763 B.C. Now, how do we know about this? Because the destruction of Nineveh was prophesied by Yehovah through his prophet Jonah. They, it was named after Bur Sagal, who was a bureaucrat within the, within the Assyrian government who would sit up on, on their pyramids all night long drinking coffee 
and writing down the celestial events of the heavens. So he recorded this total eclipse over Nineveh in 763 B.C. It caused riots in the city. There were plagues. There was a total eclipse. It was total destruction. That's what Yehovah sent his prophet Jonah to Nineveh to warn them of. Now, Jonah was not very happy with this, and he really resisted this. These were not his people. And frankly, prophets are not often received well when they go to a city to declare its destruction. So Jonah really tried to get out of this prophetic mission that he'd been given. He got on a ship and he tried to flee, a ship on the way to Tarshish. And while he was on this ship, there were great weather events. The sailors thought he was a bad omen to be on the ship, threw him overboard, and Jonah was swallowed by a big fish, presumed to be a whale. And for three days and three nights, he bumps around inside this whale and finally was spit up on the shore of Assyria itself. Now, this was a great omen to the Assyrians because they worshipped a fish god called Dagon. So when, when Jonah gets spit out of the mouth of the big fish on their very shores, they, the word spread all over very quickly. And when, when Jonah made it to Nineveh, they listened to him. And he told them they must repent. Now, at this point, they may have already had the eclipse or the eclipse came after his warning, but they had had a total eclipse. They had had riots. They had had plagues. They listened and repented. And Yehovah stayed his hand. And he asked all, the king asked all the people to repent of, their, of the things that they had done, and they did so. That it's, Nineveh was a great city, a center of culture and a center of wealth. And yet they had fallen into iniquity, a story we're probably pretty familiar with. Anyone who's been to major cities lately. But they did repent. They, they repented sincerely and Yehovah stayed his hand and did not destroy them. Now this is a very hopeful lesson to us. But why is this eclipse so important? Well, one reason is that it helps us establish the correct biblical timeline of the Bible. Starting with this, Edwin Thiele was able to, we know exactly when it happened now, was able to, we have the Assyrian king list, he could count back on the Assyrian king list, king by king, until he came to Shalmaneser III. And this was around 853 B.C. That was the date that Shalmaneser III invaded Israel and went up against a, uh, an alliance of kings, including King Ahab, who went into the Bible with, with 10,000 men and uh, was defeated. So what this does, you see, this locks us back into the timeline of Israel. So we have a scientifically determined date. Then we count back the years of the reigns of all the kings to Shalmaneser, and we have an exact date of when he entered Israel. And that is, that is absolutely authenticated by the records of the times that at the Battle of Karkar, Shalmaneser III defeated King Ahab. That puts us back in the Bible and we continue to count back on their king lists backwards and forwards to establish things like the date of Solomon's reign and David's reign and the Exodus. So this is how we have used this to establish the authentic biblical timeline of the Bible. So this is important, but it's not the only thing that this total eclipse brings to us. Remember that what happened there at this time the sign of Jonah has become 
the most important sign that Yeshua used in the Bible by which you can believe his presence. He said, I will give you one sign, the sign of Jonah. He mentions it three times, three times in, in the Gospels. By this one sign, I will be in the earth for three days and three nights, and then I will rise from the dead just like Jonah did. The only name that he associates his name with by whom you can believe in his ministry on earth. So what does all this mean to us? Well, this total eclipse at Nineveh, why is that like the eclipse of April 8th, 2024? For one thing, it, it makes a cross right in Kerrville, Texas, where I live and where the institute I direct is located. We've had two eclipses within six months. Normally an eclipse will appear anywhere about every 360 years. And so we've had two. I think God is trying to get our attention. The first one was a warm up and the second one a very dire warning. So what does any of this have to do with the eclipse over Nineveh, where Yehovah sent Jonah to warn them of their depending destruction if they did not repent, and they did repent, and he stayed the destruction of their civilization. He stopped it. He halted it because they repented. That is a hopeful lesson, is it not? Well, what about the one coming, or the one that the April 8th, uh, the April 8th eclipse. Well, it's going to appear in Kerrville, Texas, where I will be. And it is appearing at Kerrville, Texas, 1214 on April 8th. Did you know that there is a Nineveh, Texas? Well, in Nineveh, Texas, the eclipse will be visible at 1222. The eclipse will be visible over Nineveh, Missouri at 1.59 p.m. It will be visible over Nineveh, Indiana at 3.05 p.m. The eclipse will be visible over Nineveh, Ohio at 3.08 p.m. It will be visible over Nineveh, Pennsylvania at 3.15 p.m. It will be visible over Nineveh, Virginia at 3.20 p.m. It will be visible over Nineveh, New York at 3.24 p.m. And the total eclipse will be visible over Nineveh, Nova Scotia at 4.39 p.m. So what does that mean to us? The Nineveh eclipse caused the people of Nineveh, Assyria, a once great city that had fallen into iniquity. It caused them to repent. It prevented the destruction of their civilization. Is there anyone watching here who does not believe that our country and our world is in deep trouble? It is time for us as a civilization and as individuals to repent of our sins and get back into the good graces of Yehovah. And with that, we will see you again next time with more from The Writing of God. The Writing of God will continue in just a moment. I'm Dr. Miles Jones, and we have prepared for you an amazing teaching series called The Writing of God. We're going to take you to Mount Sinai and examine all of the evidence of the Exodus, both old and the newly discovered evidence that we've just brought back. Evidence that has been hidden from you for 3,500 years. Why hasn't this evidence been revealed before? Pretty simple. You know there's an anti-God agenda going on in the universities. The secularists have decided that the Bible is merely a fable. The Exodus, a legend, the mountain of God, nothing but a myth. 
And this is what they're teaching our children in the universities. This is their major tool for stripping our children of their faith. But I can tell you, we have been there. We've been to the mountain. We've examined the evidence. We've found the footprints of the Israelites there with alphabetic inscriptions. We have translated these alphabetic inscriptions and they tell a story that comes straight from the pages of Exodus. We've been to Moses' altar. We've been to Aaron's altar of the golden calf. We've been to Rephidim and the split rock and we're gonna take you there because the truth of the Bible is something you need to know. And we have the scientific evidence of the truth of the seminal event of the Old Testament, the Sinai Covenant. And we're gonna bring it to you in the writing of God. That's The Writing of God, P.O. Box 294047, Kerrville, Texas 78029, or online at thewritingofgod.com. I'm Dr. Miles Jones, author of The Writing of God. This book is about the truth of the Bible, especially the word and the writing of God given to us on tablets of stone by Yehovah at Mount Sinai. I had always been fascinated by the origin of the alphabet. Throughout my career as a historical linguist, I have been studying it. But then I was saved in the year 2000, and Yehovah began directing my steps. He took me all over the world following the footprints of the Israelites. That research, a lifetime of study, is in the writing of God. You can get it at writingofgod.com bookstore and we will send you a free research update along with your special edition copy of The Writing of God. That's The Writing of God, P.O. Box 294047, Kerrville, Texas 78029. This is The Writing of God with Dr. Miles Jones. These are really exciting stories, and if you're watching it, I know why. You cannot find this research anywhere else. So please support us by donating to our activities and our research, and by purchasing the products that we've worked hard on to offer you in these video lessons. We've got some exciting things coming out. Moedim which is the book of the celestial events of the heavens and what they mean, and also the Hebrew book of Revelation in English translation from manuscripts we have collected in the last several years and have translated for you. So don't miss out on the next episode of The Writing of God. We'll see you then. Will you seek the Lord about becoming a partner to bring the message of the writing of God to more people? Send your gift to the writing of God, P.O. Box 294027, Kerrville, Texas 78029, or online at thewritingofgod.com. That's the writing of God, P.O. Box 294047, Kerrville, Texas 78029, or online at thewritingofgod.com.